advanced map reduce. There we go. <clears throat> so you should see the slide of advanced map reduce coming in. So in this session, we are going to talk about, this is all going to be Java based. Please be mentally be ready guys, non-Java guys. We are going to implement counters in map radios. So we will see how to create a custom counters. Then there are two types of joins what we have. We have got a join at the map side. We have got a join at the reduce side. We will talk about it. Then how do I test my map reduce programs? Then we will talk about how to implement distributed cache, how to create your custom input format and sequence input format. I'm just going to log in into my Edureka and give in the password of Edureka. So if you wanted to uh, maximize the screen and if you look at your LMS folder, so if you let's double click on that LMS folder that you already have. Okay, and in that if you go down to map reduce and see over here you already have got the advanced map reduce codes. Okay, we will be looking at these codes guys. The combiner, partitioner, the counter sample, custom input format, distributed cache, MR unit, reduce join and sequence file example. We are going to look at these files so that we will uh, look at the code then. Okay, so all of these codes are ready for you. Let's say if I open up the combiner partitioner and double click on this file, it will open up that particular file and show you what the file is all about. There it is. Okay, so this is what I am going to go ahead and do it for you. Cool, let me minimize this right now and let me go back to my slide deck. There we go and let's get down to the uh, uh, topics for today. Look at the map side, reduce side, look at the data types, look at the input output formats, unit testing, counters, cache and sequence file. So now when we talk about uh, map reduce join, there is a very good article on the Edureka blog that we have kept over here. So if you click on this article, you would see that uh, there is a section on the normal join in Hive that we have versus the map reduce join that we have. So uh, this is what would be very much helpful for you to understand. So you'll have to go through and read these things guys, okay? So please have a look at this. This is what would be helpful to you. Cool. Let me move on. So the slide that we are talking about joins over here is from something called as a map side join. So what is a map side join is we will be talking about this in our distributed cache. Remember there is a uh, code on distributed cache. So what do you mean by cache? Something is being cached, right? So what is typically cached is the small table data. Okay, that is what is being cached in your distributed cache so that at the mapper time, you will go through the actual records. The big data table, what you are seeing is what is where all the records would be. Okay. Uh, all the small data table is what would be compressed and archived and will be there in the cache. Look at the arrow. Okay. The small data table will be used in my local task. It will read from the hash file. From where is the hash file coming in from? It's coming in from the cache. Okay, so that at the time when I am uh, doing my mapping, it will look at the distributed cache and it will look at my record, do a join and then give me an output. Think of this example, you want to join, uh, let me open up notepad and explain that to you. Let's say you wanted to join, you wanted to get the customer and the, cust uh, sorry, the employee name and the department name from the DPT table. My use case is I want to get the employee name and the department name. What is the tables that we have here? We have got a EMP table in Oracle. Okay, and we have got a DPT table in Oracle. Okay, which of these tables are small in a real world, guys? Would it be the EMP table which is small? So the small table data is what you would put into a distributed cache. So you might be saying that what will happen if both the tables are big enough? Okay, if both the tables are big enough, then there is another technique of doing it that is called as a reduced side join. Okay, perfect friends.
Thank you. So now we are going to see a hands-on that is joins in MapReduce. So let me go down to my, one way is see all of the slides. If I go down to my LMS and open up the slides, uh, it would take a little bit of time. I have got all of these examples already with me in my, uh, this one, what you call uh, uh, Windows itself. Instead of going to my uh, uh, virtual machine, so see over here, if I look at advanced map reduce, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? All of the seven things are already there for me in my Windows itself. So if I look at my D drive, customers, Edureka, 10 week schedule, advanced map reduce example, all of them are there. See, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay? So I've got the same folders already available over here. So I'm just going to open it up for me. So I'm not going to look at my VM, okay? I'm not going to look at this. Of course, it is there. I'm just going to minimize it. And I'm going to show you an example of MapReduce join. So let me go down to this uh, join program, okay? And uh, in every uh, program, okay, uh, uh, typically you would need a, a Java code. So... Let me go down to the LMS and ensure that we are having the same thing. See, this is a joint program. See, there is a joint problem statement document. There is a TXNS file, customer file, and the Java file. The same thing is what I am having in my folder over here. Let me minimize it and let it come down to my windows. There you see. So I'm just opening up my document from here, friends. Okay. So let me double click on this. So the example that we're going to see over here is a reduced join. The map join, like I told you, would be there in distributed cache. So what are the use case? A very common situation in many companies is that the transaction records are kept separate from the customer records, right? There is, of course, a relationship between the two. That is, the transaction ID contains the ID of the customer through which the sale was performed. So we have got two data sets, right? TXNS and CUSTS. So in the Hadoop world, this will be represented by two types of data files. That is your customer ID and the transaction ID. Frequent tasks would require reporting that use the data from both the sources. Let's say I want to find out the number of transactions in the value for a customer, but I don't want it to be based on a anonymous ID because if you do look at only the transaction, all that you will get is the ID. But if you want the name, you will have to look it at the customer table. Okay? So what is the purpose of this example? We are going to see uh, the total number of transactions and some of the transactions by joining the data from uh, two separate uh, files. Okay? We can get the report that we have explained earlier using a reduce head join. So let's go ahead and see that example of the reduce side join. What is the data that I'm having? This is a very small data, but then this is relevant for this example. So if I open up this data in my edit plus, I hardly have got 10 customers. You already have the full data, right? The uh, 9,999 files in the cust example in the upload what I have given. But here I just have got 10 files and let me open up my transactions also. And that is also a small file that we are having. Okay, let me look at the word count and this is about 60 records. But in the 60 records, see these are the customers. Customer 2 has bought 2, this is again customer 2. Let me scroll down, that's it. So customer 2, let me see if there's any more customer 2. Yeah, customer 2 has already bought this record. Customer 2 has got this record. I'm just highlighting the records for you so that you know what all things have the customer 2 bought. So if I want to find out the sum of uh, uh, products what the customer 2 has bought, I will have to write a Java code for that, friends. So that's what I am doing it right now. So let me open up my reduceside.java program. Let me do a word wrap. So before I even start, guys, since there are two data files, okay, will I need two mappers or will I need one mapper here, friends? Since I have got two mappers, okay, of course, I mean two files, I would need two mappers. 
So that's exactly what I'm going to do over here. I'm having a file called as customer mapper. Okay. Now, in the customer mapper, what am I interested in? Let me go down to the customer file. I'm interested in the customer ID, which is going to be the one that is going to link both of them. And I'm interested in the first name of the customer. So the zero and the first uh, uh, column numbers is what I'm interested in the customer file. That's what I'm doing over here. So in the map logic, what am I doing? First, I'm separating all the records based on comma so that I'll get a string array. And then I'm picking up part zero and part one. So what am I picking? I'm picking up the customer ID and I'm picking up my customer name, friends. Okay. So that's what I'm doing over here. So if you look at the key, key is the customer ID. The value contains cus because both uh, the uh, files have got the customer ID, right? So I should write a logic to understand from where the customer ID has come, from which file the customer ID has come. So that's the reason I am adding it here, cus. Slash T means a tab. Okay, so what are the key that will be there? The customer ID and then cust and then whatever is the customer name. That is what is there in the cust mapper. Similarly, I will have a transaction mapper. So what am I interested in? I'm interested in the sum of sales. So let me go back to the transaction. Which column am I interested in? Of course, I'm interested in my column number two, that is zero, one, and two. And then I'm interested in column number three, which will have the individual product value. I'm interested in the customer ID and the individual product value. So if you look at this example, I'm interested in two and I'm interested in three. Of course, in the value, I'm also suffixing my uh, TXNS because what will the shuffler do? Shuffler will ensure that all the values for the similar key will go down to the same reducer. So all the customer IDs will go down to the same reducer, but I wanted to identify what is the customer name and what is the customer amount, right? So for identifying this, I have kept a key, I have got an identifier called as CUS and TXNS so that I would know from where I have got the value. So I've got two mappers over here. Then comes my reduce logic. So let's look over here and understand what is this reduce logic going to do. So in the reducer code, what am I having? I'm creating a name. I am creating a total. Okay, because that's what I'm interested in. And of course, since we want to have the count and the sum of transactions along with the name, what is my purpose? For every customer, I want to know the total number of transactions and the quantity of the transaction along with the name. So line number 41, 42, 43 are the three things that I would want to output. Then I put it into a loop because why I'm getting a values, list of values, right? And then what do I do? I separate all the values by tab. I look at the first value. If the first value contains TXNS, that means uh, for my customer, I will have multiple transactions, right? So what do I do? If the first value contains TXNS, so the guarantee of the framework is that all the similar values will go down to the same reducer. So all the customer will go down to the same reducer. And in the reducer, I would look at what is the uh, customer uh, transaction. And I'll keep on incrementing the count. And along with the count, I will have the value also, right? So see what am I doing? This line, what you see on line number 48, is what is uh, keeping on incrementing the value. Total is zero. And then I pick up every value and look at that plus equal to. That means I'm keeping on adding the values. So now I have got the count of transactions and the total for every customer. Now, if that part contains customer, I will assign the first value of that to the name. So I get the customer name also. Now, how do I put three things uh, uh, as an output from a reducer? You can have only two things, right? So what do I do? I create a string called as transaction, and then I give a tab, and I get my count and the total. So count and total is there in one key. And then I specify my name. 
the name of the customer and I pass on the value as a string. String internally would have the uh, number of transactions and the total of the transactions. So this is what the final output would come out to. You will see the, for the name of the customer and the number of transactions and the total value of the transaction. So this is what I will be doing it in my reducer logic, okay? And if you look at my driver code, everything is the same. But then the new thing over here is we typically use to say file input format, right? Instead of file input format, I will use multiple inputs because I have got more than one input. I need to pass both the TXNS and my CUSTS, right, to my program, to my MapReduce program. So I would say the first value that I give okay would be my uh, customer file for that i will use my text input format class you know that is slash n and uh, the mapper that i will use for the first uh, uh, input is customer mapper then for the second input the formatting will be done by text input format again new line and uh, i will use a transaction mapper for the second input okay for the third input I would put that, that is the path that I need for my file output format. See, I get the job and I get my actual path. And then, what am I doing in line number 74? You know that uh, by default, if a folder is already there, it will not override that folder. Every time I have to give a new name. So if I'm going to run this example multiple times, I am programmatically deleting my output path. So line number 74 is what is uh, getting that uh, path, whatever is there from the file system, and then deleting it. And then I do my job dot wait for completion. If you look at what is my jar, my main program is my jar. You see what is my reducer, I specify my reducer. I specify my mapper over here, and the output key class and output value class. This is the first example, guys, okay? So this is what is your first example, which is your uh, trans join example, guys, okay? I would want you to actually run this example, okay? So here I'm explaining the whole code to you, okay, so that you understand what it is. You know how to create the jar file and how to run the examples. You will have to actually try it out, okay? It would make no sense if I simply run this and show it to you because it will only, uh, I know the code will run. It is only going to be a practice for me. I'm not going to do that. I want you to do it. If you get stuck, please be in touch with support and me and we will help you out. So that is what is joins in MapReduce. <clears throat> now, let's get down to the input format. We already know that text input format, like what we do uh, did earlier, is the new line for the input format. So see over here, the input file, there would be a input split, a record. Uh, that is a line. The record reader class will convert that into a key value pair so, uh, because what you get is a line. Who will convert that into offset point and the value, the record reader? That will go to the mapper, and then the intermediate files are stored as an output of the mapper in your local directory. Okay, that is in your node. This is what is your input format. Now, there are a lot of input formats, guys. The default input format is text input format. You will also have got something called as combined input format if you want to combine multiple things. Did we not see multiple inputs right now when you are having more than one? Then you will also have a key value input format. Imagine if your data, if your customer name comes as first name, middle name, last name. I don't want every line to be one record, right? You want three lines to be one record or address one, address two, a city, state, a pin code, country. You want six lines to be one record. That is a use case wherein you will specify the N line input format. You can also use binary data in Java, right? So you would use sequence file as binary input format. Okay, and plus you can also talk to a database and that's why you will also have a DB input format also. So these are the various input formats that we have and we are going to see how to create a custom input format also in our code guys, okay?
So like your input format, there is an output format. So whatever is the output that is given by the red user, there would be a record writer, which will write it into key value pairs, and there would be an output file that will be created from it, guys. So the output file, guys, where is the final output stored? I forgot if you can let me know. I run a job, where is the final output stored? So you will see the record writer writing somewhere. Where will the final output file be? Very good. Ravindra is giving me the answer with a smiley. That's nice. Just want to ensure that all of you are still awake. Okay, very good, Arun, Revati, Joby, Men, Ravi, Ravindra, and Rajesh. The output file will be there in HDF. As I know this is going to be a little bit tough for the non-Java guys, but then I really appreciate you sticking around. So similar to the output, the input format, there are various output formats. You will have a text output format. You can have a sequence output format as a binary format. You can have something as a null output format. That means I don't expect any value to come. That means there's only a mapper. There is no reducer. There is a DB output format also. So there are various types of output formats also, which you can tweak around because this is an enterprise application, right? So now, let's see how to work with a custom input format. So this is a, the toughest example in whole of our uh, uh, course. So this is the toughest Java example. So Java guys would love this. Non-Java guys understand what we are doing, guys. So let me go back to my folder. That is called as, uh, uh, where is my custom input format? And you'll see there are multiple files over here. Let me go down to my virtual machine. Okay, come on. Edureka has thrown me out. Let me sign in. And if I go down to my custom input format, don't you see there are so many files? They're exactly the same number of files. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight files. And similarly over here also you have got eight files. So this is just to give you the comfort level that I'm using the same file, okay? So let's look at the uh, problem statement. So always start from the docx file which will contain the problem statement. So let it come up. So in this example, we are going to see how to implement a custom input format. Hadoop allows us to implement and specify custom input format for our MapReduce computation. Okay, so what are we doing here? We are trying to create a custom input format for some sensor data that we are having. So when we talk about the automation world, there is uh, a lot of sensor data that will be there. There will be a lot of machine data that will be there. Okay, so uh, in, in the data that comes in, you will have a sensor ID, the equipment that has generated that sensor. There would be a timestamp as to when the sensor was uh, triggered, some kind of status column in my use case, and some set of values in my use case. So I've got five uh, separate columns in my sensor data. Okay. So now I want to create my own custom input format because new line is not going to help me, okay? And the moreover, I want sensor ID and uh, timestamp and status to be my key. So I don't want one key. I want uh, the first three columns separated by tabs to be one key and the value to, uh, one and value to be the value. So in this example, we are going to implement a input format. Whenever there's an input format, there is a record reader, right? What does the input format do? It only tells me how to separate the records. Then once you get a record, how to convert that into a key value is done by the record reader. Okay, so these are the steps. So these steps is my code. These steps are not there in the original code. I just want to confirm that and show it to you. Let me go back. Let me open up the docx file. It will open up in uh, library office couple of seconds guys so see here the logic is the same but then there is no steps over here just one sec let the page quickly come up there we go so this is your library office writer and you don't see there's any value over here okay so what are the first step I have to define my key class and my value class so if you look at it this is what is my key and what is my value let me open up my key class Java class 
So any key that you are uh, implementing, that you are writing, should implement something called as writable comparable because your keys are going to be sorted, right? So that's the reason why you are using the comparable uh, interface. And what are the three things that is going to be there in my key? In my example, I've got the sensor type, the timestamp, and the status. And I'm keeping everything as text for the purpose of simplicity. You can have it as a uh, type also. Then I have got a constructed which will initialize it and a parameterized constructed which will initialize it. By default, there will be a method called as read fields and write, which will take in its parameters type of data input and data output. And from each of those types, you will read the data in. So this is what is input. And you will write the data out that is what is your output. And since we are having a comparable interface, you are going to write the logic how do I decide which is going to be before the other? So you will override the compare to logic and you will write your business logic. Okay? And then, of course, there are getter and setter methods for all of the different types. This is how you will identify a key, my dear friends. Okay? So similar to your my key, you will have your my value. So I will create a my value. What will the value have? It will have two fields. There's a constructor. There is a read fields. There is a write. And there is a comparator. That's it. So based on your, uh, and, and why are we giving this to you? So that you have a ready-made template. Tomorrow you want to write your own code. You can use this template and uh, uh, make it effective. Okay? So if you look at my code, so let me close my joint problem statement. So first two steps are done here. Then you create a input format class and a record reader. Okay, so first let me go down to my record reader class. So what is a record reader? It will, once you get a key, uh, I mean a line, okay, you will have to specify how do I read the data from that line. That is what is the job of your record reader. So now in my record reader, uh, I will always extend a default record reader which will have a key and a value. And what is that? My key and my value. Okay. Um, since I'm extending a record reader, I'm going to create instance of a line record reader. That's what we're going to do because we're going to read lines. Then in that, you'll have to specify what is your current key, what is your current value, progress, initialize, etc. The most important logic will be there in the next key value. Okay, so what do I do? I will get the key. So once you get the key, you will get the current value of the key. Remember, the uh, input format will give you the line. Once you get the line, you will have to write the logic for your uh, column separator or your, sorry, you will have to write the logic for your key and value, right? So what should be the key in my this example? First three lines should be the key. So I get all of that text, so split it by slash. And so what do I get here, friends? So this is what I'll be getting, okay? When I get a whole line, okay? What am I interested in that particular line? I'm interested in the first three columns being the key and the next two columns being the value. So that's what I'm doing over here. See over here, I'm adding my first three uh, values to the key and I'm adding the other two values to the value. So this is the logic that you will be writing in your record reader, okay? This record reader is going to be used in your input format. So what do I do? I will, my input format will always extend some system defined class that is file input format, which will of course take the key and the value. And then there is a method called as create record reader because based on your new line, it will get that particular record reader and you will simply return the record reader what you have just created in step number three. 
Okay, which record reader are you going to use? You are going to use my record reader. That's the class that we just did earlier, uh, which will identify how to pick up from one line. The first three things I'll assign it to the key, and the other two things I'll assign it to the value. So, so these are the four things that is uh, special in a custom code. So you would create a key class, you will create a value class, you will create a record reader, and you will create an input format class. Then you will use it in your mapper code, and then you will write your driver code. That's pretty simple. This is what is MapReduce. So if you look at your uh, my mapper logic, so what am I doing in the my mapper? This is nothing but the code that you have been doing until now. You'll have a map function. You will get the sensor type. So in my logic over here, if the sensor type is A, then I'm interested in the both the values. Okay, I'll say contest dot write value dot get value one and value dot get value two friends. Okay. So this is your mapper. So what am I interested? I'm interested only in the first two values of my uh, sorry. I'm interested only in va value A. There are multiple sensor types, right? So imagine if you are working for a security company, you'll have multiple sensors at multiple locations. You would want to filter down the uh, sensor types, and then you will have to get the data, right? So here I'm only interested in sensor type A. I'm interested in the value of it. And finally, you will have your myfile.java. This is what is going to be my entry point. That is my main. I'll create my job. I'll create my jar file. I don't have a reduce over here. I have a mapper class as my mapper. I have a map output key class over here. And see what is the input format class that I'm using here. You see the input format I'm using over here is my input format. And then I send it to my uh, files, and I would wait for completion. Okay, friends. So what did we learn over here? We had uh, four codes, which is custom codes, then the mapper and the reducer. The data file is here. This is your data file. Input data.txt is your data file. See over here, I have got, I will double click on that. And there you see, I have got two readings for A and one reading for B. That is what is the final output, what you will be seeing, folks. OK? So that was our example of our demo on our custom input format. So now the last thing that we're going to say about the MR unit. So remember I said, what is JUnit? JUnit is a simple, repeatable uh, Java framework for testing. The MR unit gives you four drivers. So you need to have the jar file of the MR unit, and in the code we have provided that. There is a map driver which will only test your mapping logic. That is a map function. There is a reduce driver which will only test your reduce logic. Then there is a map reduce driver which will check both the mapper and the reducer for one job. And then you have got a pipeline map reduce driver which will check the map reduce for a chain of jobs. Okay? So the MR unit framework helps in filling the gap between the map reduce and the J unit. And you can have a better control on the log messages with the J unit integration. Let's see the unit testing framework. How does the unit testing would work? So let me go back to the Java code and I would have my MR unit. This will have two Java files. It will have, I mean, one Java file and one Word document. So let me open up the Word document. So the, so this is that file. So what do we do for this MR unit? You will have to download some additional library. The library is already provided to you. So we are giving you screenshots as to how you will download the library in your Cloudera. Okay, we already provided all of that for you. Okay, see over here you will have the jar files. I'm scrolling down. You will have to import all the jar files to the lib folder of your down of your Eclipse project. You know that we have done this before. Okay, then uh, you will have to ensure that uh, you uh, select the add jars. You already know that. 
we have done that before. We're just giving you a screenshot so that it becomes clear to you. Select all the jars to add them to the project that we are using. Okay, and that's it. Okay, friends. So now, whenever you are doing a MR unit, there are five steps that will always be there. Let you let uh, whether you are testing your mapper, your reducer, you are one job that is one mapper and one reducer, or a series of jobs that is different mappers and reducers. You would always have uh, this kind of a logic. Okay. So what are the first thing that you're going to do? You will instantiate a instance of the map driver class. Okay, that means you will create a instance of the driver class. Let it be a map driver, reduce driver, map reduce driver, or pipeline map reduce driver. Exactly as the mapper that you are testing it. Then you will add an instance of your mapper with the with mapper a function of your driver class. Then you will give with input what is your record that you want to give. Then with your with output you will specify what is the output that you are expecting. And finally you will run the test. Okay. So when you run the test, you would it will tell me whether the test has passed or failed. And that is the way how you will do it. Now the question is, for the non-Java guys, uh, when you're running a unit testing or a map reduce code, uh, do I need a jar file or I don't need a jar file, guys? Can I test it in my Eclipse directly? <coughs> when you typically you will create as export as a jar file and then do it, or will I create a uh, directly right click and run the code? What do we typically do, guys? Like for unit testing. You don't need the jar file. So now let's get down to the Java code for it. So I'm going to open up my Java code. So see over here, what are we doing over here is I'm creating a class, okay, in which there is a class called as map test, which will have a function called as map. So I am having the actual map reduce code and the MR code tightly coupled. You can have it loosely coupled also. Okay, there are again two approaches for testing. You can have one code which will be the mapper code and you can keep it separately or in a test case you can tightly couple it also. Okay, but then which is more commonly used? The loose coupling is more commonly used. But here we are just demoing an example of a tight coupling friends. Okay. Then what do I do over here? I have got my uh, map function. <clears throat> See over here. Then uh, in my uh, first step, I instantiate, I declare my map driver and I instantiate it. Okay. <clears throat> so see over here, I would be saying new. Let me go down. I would have to say new for this map driver. I'm surprised they haven't given it over here. So please remember this, guys. When you're running this, it would give me an error called, hey, they have done it. Sorry, see here. They have kept a new map driver. No problem. They have done it here. So, and then you declare, what are the five steps? You declare a map driver and instantiate it. First step. In the second step, what do you do? You pass your own mapper instance to the map driver. In the third step, see this is the annotation for the test, you create an input, you create an output, and the fifth step is you run it. <clears throat> okay, so this is the way how you'll be doing it. In case, uh, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to show you, uh, I have got a map reduce code for my, uh, this one, uh, what I call for the transaction example. Let me share that with you guys. Okay, you would have already written a map reduce code. So if you want to run test that map reduce code for a transaction example, I will show that to you and I'm going to share that with you. Okay, so that this is one example of map reduce that they have shown it to you. You can also use map reduce on the txns file that I'm going to share with you, friends. I'll put it in the same copy location. Okay. So this is your logic. So what are we testing here? We are testing only my map function. Okay. Similarly, you will have a reduce driver which will test a reduce function. You can have a map reduce driver which will test both of them and you can have a chain of it. So this is your logic of your map reduce testing guys.
Okay. So what are counters? Counters are lightweight objects in Hadoop that keep a track of the system progress in a map and a reduce stage. See there is a file system counter, there is a job counter, how many number of uh, map input records was there, output records was there, right? So that is what is a counter. Counters are typically used to gather information about the data that we are analyzing, like how many types of records was processed, how, if you are having any invalid record, how many invalid records were found, etc. So that is what is primarily counters. So we are going to continue with a quick demo of what is the, how to go ahead with your custom counters. So if you look at your document for your counter, you would see that what is Hadoop counters? Counters are primarily for reporting the metrics of your job. They are one of the ways how to report the statistics of a job. So while working with an application, you would always be interested in gathering information about the data that you're analyzing, like how many types of records was processed, how many invalid records, if any were found while running a job, etc. So this functionality need of yours is addressed to by uh, the counters that we have, okay? So uh, counters are primarily lightweight objects which helps us in tracking the progress of a job. So take an example. I have got a data set with some timestamp. Let's say one, two, three, and there are some timestamps over here. I want to find out how many month-wise records are processed by the mappers while they are executing. Okay, so that's the purpose. If you scroll down, there is a little bit of theory of your counters which tells you about what all are the built-in counters that we have. You have got a map reduce counters, you have got uh, your custom counters. When you create your own custom counter, the first thing that you have to do is to create something called as an enum. A enum is something which will have some variables. So in the example, I'm having an enum called as my counter, which will have missing and total as two variables. Okay, please remember counters are global. So the counter values are shared by all the map reduced tasks because we're talking about parallel processing, right? So that's the way how the uh, counters are shared across, uh, across the different tasks, across multiple nodes and are aggregated at the end of the job across all the tasks, across separate nodes. So once you create a counter, how do I use the counter? The usage of the counter is simple. You will use that counter in your map function or in your reduce function. You will say context.getCounter. You will get your counter and then you will write your business logic. So in my example, if a record is missing or if it is an invalid record, I will increment my missing counter. And then if it is a valid or invalid record, if I just want to show how many counters are processed, I will increment my total counter. This is just as a use case. So now let's go back to our example. So if I open up my counters example, you will see that I have got the input data, which is exactly like what I have shown it to you earlier. Uh, it will have some numbers and it will have a timestamp. And then I'm going to have a Java code, which is going to tell me how to use the counter. Okay. So I have opened up my Java code and see how I have got a, a enum called as month. Similarly, imagine you are trying to do a counter on the transaction record, which is a one, uh, which is a one million record, and I want to find out how many records of California, Florida, and Ohio were there when I was doing an analysis. If that is what you want to find out, you will create a enum called as state, okay? That's the way how you'll be using your counters. Uh, so you created an enum. Then in my mapper, what am I doing is, so what is the input data I'm having? Input data has got some numbers and it has got a comma and it has got a timestamp. So I need to split it, right? So I go back to my Java code and see how in line number 29 and splitting it based on comma. Then your uh, first record, that is zero is a, a number, second is the timestamp. I get that timestamp, convert into a long, convert into a date. From the date, I will get the month. Because my business use case over here is I want to count the number of month records that I'm processing. That is what is my business use case. So 
I say if the month is 11, I would say context dot get counter of month that is my enum dot December. I'll increment it as per some logic. If it is a zero, that is Jan. I'll increment it by something. If it is by Feb, I'll increment it by something. Just my business logic. Or if since we are talking about another example of the transaction data set, if my string 7, why 7? Because that is where the state would come. If it is California, then I will increment 1. Because there I want to find out the number of records that I see for California, Ohio, and what are the other state I said, Florida, uh, that I am having in my data. So this is how in your mapper you will increment your counter and that's it. Then where do you display the counter? Obviously you will display the counter in your main function. So if you scroll down, you will see over here how uh, you will say job.getCounters, which will get me the counter. And then I say find counter for whatever is the uh, uh, values of the enum what you're having. And then display the name of the counter and the value of the counter. Okay. So what am I doing for December? I'm showing you how for Jan I'm showing you how and for Feb I'm showing you how so in the real world you would have it for like in a California example you will show how many California records was processed how many Ohio or how many Florida records was processed. So like the way you see the output. Let me go down to the PDF file. <clears throat> so you see something called as file system counter similar to that. You will see the counter. What do you see in the file system counters? A key, right? File e colon something. Similarly, you will see the key December colon and it will give you the value of it. Okay? So it will tell you this is what is the key. The number of write operations is equal to zero. The number of read operations is equal to six and all that you are seeing, right? So that is the way how the counter will be displayed to you folks. Fine? Now let's talk about something like cache. Remember I told you about cache in the map join example when I started with this slide. So what is primarily a cache is a facility provided by the MapReduce framework to cache the file so that I don't have to read it every time. Logically as the name cache suggests, uh, what can you cache? You can cache your text files, your archives and your jar files that is all needed by your applications. So if you are having multiple nodes and there are multiple map tasks that will be run, files are copied only once per node and of course it should not be modified by the application when the job is running. That's what is the logic of the cache and uh, after the job gets finished the cache would be removed. So cache can be used to distribute simple read only data text files or any complex types uh, using job conf or using the job class. Okay. So let's see a little bit more about <coughs> what this cache is all about. So I'm going to give you a demo of it. So let me go down to the folder that would be called as distributed cache. And there are two word documents that you have over here. You will have a document which will explain what this cache is to you. Once again, and then we will talk about the problem statement. <coughs> Let me open up the uh, distributed cache. So come on, there we go. So what is it? When we are writing MapReduce code, you may be required to share some files across all the nodes in the cluster. It could be a properties file or it could be an executable file. And the framework gives you a facility for doing this with something called as distributed cache. Okay. So what will the framework do? The fra uh, first of all, the cache assumes that whatever files that you are specifying are already present in the file system. So of course it has to be in your uh, SDFS, okay? Uh, as you are specifying it via a URL and is accessible by every machine in the cluster. Then the framework will copy the necessary files onto the slave nodes before any task is executed on that node. Okay. So how do we do this? First step, you will have to copy the files to the file system that is your HDFS. Then you will create instance of your job or your job conf class and then you will say distributed cache dot add cache file, give it a URL and then associate it with a job. 
Okay, what is that the URL? Nothing but uh, what I have put it into HDFS. It is nothing but an HDFS path. Then in your mapper or in your reducer logic, okay, you will say distributed cache dot get uh, local cache files. You will get a list of all the uh, uh, path URLs, and then using your buffered reader or some logic, you will read that particular file, and then use that within your map or your reduce function. You might be wondering why am I doing it in a method called a setup. So if you look at the documentation, you will see that setup method is called first before a map gets executed, and after that is a method called as map that will be called first. So this is the theory part of it. How I can use my cache. There is a full chapter in the definitive guide on distributed cache. Okay, there are two techniques of doing it. Using a cache, there are two techniques of site distribution. That is, for, uh, passing reference data or the metadata, or the lookup data. One is using configuration, another is using cache. Now let's look at the problem statement. So I have double clicked on the problem statement. So here we are going to use a example where you are going to use a distributed cache in MapReduce to find out the lines that contains the matching keywords okay so like a dpt and a emp table i have got a source data which has got some abbreviations and some population so let's say i want to have state wise population so i'll say up mp bi west bengal whatever are the different states and the population now when i do it at the real time i don't want it to be given as up i wanted the full name to be given so there will be a metadata file or some master data file which will have the translation of your uh, values remember i had mentioned about dpt and my emp table so almost exactly similar to that friend okay so now i would read this file in the mapper and the reducer where we can write the logic so this is the problem statement so we are going to see the code where it is going to have but before that you have a file two files your lookup dot dat and your dc input distributed cache input is going to be the file which will give you the reading of your population so it will show you <coughs> the states and the population the lookup dot dat file is a metadata file that i'm having which will contain the abbreviated values so it will contain what is the state and what is the name of the state like up would have uttar pradesh okay so these are my two input files one of them i'm going to load it through the cache another one i'm going to pass it through my map reduce program so which one i'll be loading it through cache over here guys of course the lookup dot dat file that is a metadata file so now let me go back to the java code let me open up my distributed cache dot java let me do a word wrap over here so what are we doing first i'm having a class called as mapper in which i'm having a map map is nothing but a collection of keys and values okay then in the setup method setup method is called for the first time in the program starts okay so what do i do in the setup method i am saying distributed cache dot get cache files and i'm getting the configuration i will get a list of files because they could be multiple files from i'll put it into a loop and then i'm looking at that individual file that is called as lookup dot dat once i get that file i will read that file and then put it into line by line and then i will loop through the line and in that line what am i doing i am breaking it up based on slash t because you see the lookup dat dot is separated by a tab space over here friend okay so now the first value sorry the first value is what i will be putting it into a string called as ab the second value i'll put it into a state that is abbreviation and state and then i'll put it into a map so the map will have it in the memory all of these values that's it so if the map is empty i will say unable to load so that user will come to know that there is an exception then in my map logic what do i do this is what is going to look up my uh, dc input distributed copy input i will get an each, each individual row i'll break it up using tab so i will get the first uh, line that is up 
okay then what do i do i if, uh, this is the key right so i look at the map with the key and i will get the actual state so you have got the state then to the output key you are setting the state and the output value you are giving the whole record okay both the up and the state or else if you want you can only set a population also what is population i get the one so that's why i've commented line number 55 and 15 and i have commented here i'm giving the whole data so how will the final input look like uttar pradesh space up tab and so and so value if you want only uttar pradesh and the value then you will have to use the population and see how i have set the population and then i will write the key and the value that's it so you are reading the distributed cache in your setup method in the map method you are getting the value then taking that from the hash map from where we populated our uh, key value pairs but i haven't shown you where you have added that file and that is what is coming up in your main method so see over here how i add that particular url that is the lookup dot that file uh, from my distributed cache in my main function guys okay so that was our use case about our distributed cache see here uh, this is what is additional code what i have written i am just going to copy this and put it into your chat window so that you would also have it there we go so you upload the reference data to the sdfs use distributed cache to add the reference data to the job and then in the setup method you should actually get it so that was our example of our cache let me go back to the pdf <clears throat> now we are going to talk about <coughs> sequence files okay so what are sequence files see you know that hadoop is not restricted for processing only your textual data hadoop can even do your binary data so if you want to do any binary data you would use sequence file so what is a sequence file it's a flat file consisting of binary key values it is used in map reduce by default i said that uh, the output of a mapper is stored in sdfs right Oh, sorry is stored in the local directory right so how is it stored it is stored in the form of a sequence file okay so output of maps are stored as sequence file which provides three things it gives you a writer it gives you a reader and it gives you a sorting thing we can directly implement this in our code okay so see over here there are three types of sequence files that we will be using so sequence file either can be uncompressed or it can be record compressed where only the values are compressed or it can be block compressed where both the keys and the values are uh, compressed and stored separately so what is the purpose of the sequence file one to enable binary data that's what we are going to see the second objective of sequence file imagine remember i told you the small file problem hadoop is not for small files because the time taken for you to process small files is much more so uh, in case if you have got uh, let's say you have got one file of 100 mb versus 100 files of 1 mb you would know that it is better to have one file of 100 mb right it is always a, not a good idea to have 100 files of 1 mb in hadoop so you would want to pack all the small files into a single large file for the map reduce computation because the design of hadoop is for large files we are going to see both of them in our example over here okay so uh, the slide that i'm going to show you is just showing you what is record compression so record compression only the values are compressed and uh, in your block compression both the keys and the values would be compressed see over here the next slide i'll just come up there it is you would see it showing you as block compression both the keys and the values would be compressed now i'm going to take you to a hands on wherein i'll show you the binary data processing using your uh, map reduce so let's get down to the folder structure wherein you will have sequence file example so what am i having i am having a set of binary images okay see over here how do i find out if that image contains duplicates or not <clears throat> if i want to find out 
how many uh, unique images are in this example. That means I want to discard all the duplicate images. How do I do it? I don't have a technique of looking at the binary data, right? So I have to use a sequence file. There are three unique images, one this image, one with the white, and one with slake.jpg, okay? This is what is my uh, input data. Let me go back to my uh, sequence file example. So here, let me first open up the Word document and explain to you what we are doing here so that it will become crystal clear for you as to what we are doing. Okay, so what is sequence file? We are just showing you the use of sequence file. It is used to process data and plus it is for the text data. Whatever I said right now, I have put it into a documentation over here so that you'll understand. Now, let's look at the use case. The problem statement that I have here is, let's assume I have got a lot of small image files and need to remove duplicate files from the available data. Although I've got only 10 files, imagine I've got 1 million uh, records and I want to do that. So as most binary uh, formats, particularly that is compressed or encrypted, cannot be split and should be read together. So using such files would mean that a single mapper would be used, giving you a performance hit. So it's better to put all of them together into one file that is called a sequence file. And that's what we're doing in the example here. Okay. So what are the steps? We are going to do it in two steps. The first step, I am going to create a sequence file from a lot of images. First of all, I will have to move all the files to HDFS. Then I'll prepare a list of the files which has to be given as input to our mapper. And I will use my binary uh, files to sequence file Java code to convert uh, the sequence file into binary. The input is the file path. And second file, uh, second Java code will be to remove the duplicates from the sequence file. So there will be a image driver which will have a mapper and a reducer and it will create a list of the non-duplicated files. That means you'll get all the unique files. Okay. So let's see the first file. How do we convert it into a uh, sequence file? There we go. So let me uh, do a word wrap here. And first, let me see what is the input. The input would be uh, this file. So let me just show it to you. You'll have to copy all of the files to your images folder. So what will be the input? The path, right? The path of each file is what would be the input. Okay. So you have got a lot of small files over here. So let me go back to the Java code. So here, what are the first thing I'm having over here is See how I will be talking to the file system. Because I said slash images slash something, right? So I, I will talk to the file system. Okay. Then what do I do? For every location that you give, I will open up that particular file. Okay. Then I will have a byte array output stream. And then I will read the content of that byte array output stream and uh, uh, I mean read the content of every file. So in dot read, what is in? You're opening up that particular file, you're reading that content and you are writing it to the byte array. So you know that one record, slash n is a record, right? So this map function will be called for every record, you know that, right? So what is the input that am I having to this program? Go down to the document. The input is the file path, right? So that is the uh, file path. So which is that file? This is the input that we are having. See over here, it will come up there, you see. So you have got images autoloan.png. That is one record, right? Because I said slash n. That record will be read by, it will be opened up uh, by your in statement. It will open up that particular file. Then it would uh, read that particular file and then write it into the buffer byte array. And what is it the outputting? It is outputting the name of the file slash images slash autoloan.png. And what is the value of it? The byte array. That's it. Okay, so look at this problem statement. What is the input? The input is the file path. And what is the output? The each individual file path. The first is the input file path file. 
the whole file containing the input path, the output is every file uh, path and the byte array of the file. Okay. So where will the uh, this be stored? It will be stored in HDFS because uh, this is one MapReduce program. So let me go back and show you the driver of it. This is the driver code, public static void main in the same file. Scroll down. The most important thing over here is look at line number 70. What are we doing? We said that uh, the output would be a sequence file, right? See over here in line number 70, a job dot set output format class is going to be sequence file output format class, right? What is the output uh, value type? Bytes writable, right? Because it's a byte writable array of characters, right? So the array of bytes, right? So this is how you will be running the first job. So what have you done? You have got a file path. You have read each file path and from each file path you have got a byte array now. Good. We have done our first step right now. Now let's get down to the second step. So in the second step, let's look at the mapper code. The name of the mapper code over here is image duplicate mapper. Let me do a word wrap. Okay. And let's scroll down. So see over here, that is the Java code that I'm having over here. Let me scroll down. See over here, there is a function that I have got that is going to be called as calculate MD5. What does it take? It takes a byte array. The input to my, the value of my uh, record which will go down to as a sequence file is a byte array, right? I've got a path and I've got a byte array. From the byte array, I will get a MD5 16 digit string. If the string is the same, that means the image is the same, right? So I have got a user defined method over here from line number 46 to line number 57. This is what is the logic which I picked it up from the internet, okay? This is to calculate the MD5. Now, what do I do? I have got a text which is the file name. What is the input to your this particular mapper? The name of the, the path of the file and a byte writable because that is what is an array, right? So see what am I doing? I am saying in my every map, I say calculate MD5 value dot get bytes, which will convert that byte writable into an array of bytes and then I will get my MD5 string. So what do I do out of the mapper? I will put the MD5 string, okay, as a key, as a key and the file path as a value. What is this key over here, the file path, right? So see what am I doing? I'm putting the file uh, in the map where the MD5 is the key, so the duplicates will be grouped together for the reduce function. So now if there are 10 files having the same MD5, what will the shuffler in this job do? it will ensure that all the values for the same MD5 key are brought together so that you will get all the duplicates going down to one mapper, right? So this is your mapping logic. Now let me open up the reducing logic. So I open up my image duplicates reducer. The output is the MD5 string that I got, 16 digit hash string, that is the key and the value is the file name. So all the similar files will have the same MD5 text, right? So all the files having the similar images will go down to one reducer over here. Got it? The key here is MD5 hash and the value is all the image files are associated with it. And we need to take only one file because we are interested only in the originals. So I loop through all the list of files that I get and I copy that particular file path to the image file path because I'm only interested in one. And then what do I uh, give it as an output? The image file path which I got as a key is the output and the key that I got in from my program that is MD5 is what is the output I'll, I'll give. So what is the end result of this? I will be getting only unique images. I'm discarding all the files with the different images. So if you run the same example, you will see that there will be only three unique files that will be there in our example. I've got about 11 images and, and uh, nine of them are, uh, what I call, copy, eight of them are copies. So I will get only three things.
For non-Java guys, this will be a little bit heavy, but then the good news is today is the last day that we are getting into Java. Okay, so don't worry about it. So this is purely, completely advanced MapReduce, guys.